Hi, and welcome to livingpianos.com. I'm Robert Estrin, and today we have a very special guest, concert pianist and novelist, Jack Cole. Welcome, Jack. Thank you, Robert. Honored to be here. Yes. Now, interestingly, we have so much in common, and that I didn't discover until reading your uh, latest novel, That Iron String, which we're going to talk about. Uh, but we're both from Long Island, and yes. we come from a background in classical piano. And we've taken different paths, but there is a commonality that we have that anybody who's really successful in, in the piano world knows, which is you have to be very creative and find new outlets. Mm. And in your novel, The Iron String, you talk about the incredible, the plethora of accomplished pianists and the dwindling numbers of positions mm -hmm. for people specializing in this field. And I want you to tell us a little bit, first of all, about yourself sure. and your background in writing as well as piano and how you came to writing this uh, trilogy of novels, which we'll talk about further. Well, thank you, Robert. I started life as a pianist, not particularly enthusiastic about studying the piano at first, but we had a piano in our home and my mother and father like Many parents wanted me to study the piano, and eventually I started to take to it. And then a few cathartic things made me really take to it after a while. And I went through the process of pre-college study at Juilliard, and then I went to Queens College in New mm -hmm. York, and then went on to graduate school. And I was always good enough, I think, for no one to dissuade me. Mm -hmm. But I think some of us, and I'm honest enough with myself to know that I'm one of those people always knew somewhere inside that I'm not really one of the chosen pianists. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean there are enough recordings, we all have enough chance to see really gifted pianists mm -hmm. to know who are those seven or eight or ten who really can make a lifetime only playing before the public. And yet, as I observe, there's almost a tragic element in that one can play just well as enough not to know until you take it as far as you can. And one can have professors that can tell you all the problems that you're going to face, but you can play well enough that they're not certain where you're going to go either. But eventually, of course, things level off. And yet, in that process, I was privileged to see people that I knew seemed to have that invincible skill, where they could almost, in a quasi Glenn Gould way, I remember reading the Jonathan Cott book, Conversations with Glenn Gould, where he would talk about being able to freeze and then summon the idealized versions when he would need it. And I knew that I was never to be one of those people. However, I imagined someone with that skill and then came up with a protagonist for a book mm -hmm. where he experienced the same leveling off that someone with much more humble abilities like myself would. And so I imagined what is it like for those people? And there are really countless people like that because I think the pedagogical field and the history of the piano now is so refined that we can produce people of almost supernatural ability, but the market can't really bear their presence in terms of the numbers of people that we need playing with the great orchestras or playing in mm -hmm. recitals, at least in respect to what my, one might fantasize that they're going to do when they're a young person in terms of thinking they're going to have this Listian <laughs> glory. Well, it's true that the mm -hmm. conservatories and music schools all around the country and around the world mm. are training everyone to do exactly the same thing. Yes. And one classic example of the shortcomings of music schools is coming out of music school, being able to read obscure things like figured bass mm. and being able to do uh, you know, four-part harmony and all of this, and yet they never teach you how to read a lead sheet, yes. which is the first time you have an actual job that pays money, <laughs> it's probably going to be a lead sheet. Yes. Uh, and hopefully music schools are starting to embrace technology because composers today, uh, really it's to their interest to be able to work with Sibelius or Finale, mm -hmm. to be able to realize things and augment, in, as a matter of fact, utilizing 21st mm -hmm. century technologies, which everything is so back in the 19th century yes. and before. And it's a real disservice because you mentioned people mm -hmm. who maybe aren't of the absolute pinnacle, yes. uh, not being able to have an outlet, but even the people who are, mm -hmm. it's kind of something akin to the Olympics, yes. you know? The somebody who comes in, you know, second, third, fourth, you know, maybe it was a bad day. Yes. <laughs> and mm -hmm. 
And it's the same thing with piano competitions. You mm -hmm. listen to anybody who even enters the Clyburn mm -hmm. or the Tchaikovsky, the repertoire requirements are so formidable that just entering means that you are on an, a supreme level of accomplishment. Right. Absa your analogy with the Olympus ex is exactly mm -hmm. the case. Because is the second or third place person really judged by the heat, so to speak, that race? Mm -hmm. At least in a piano competition sense, right. where it's much more of a subjective thing because it's art. Mm -hmm. So I imagined one of those people who also I thought would be a creditable human being in the sense that we're all ultimately taught that if something goes wrong in our lives, the person that if we're going to blame anyone, we really should blame ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I imagined a person that was not able to blame other human beings, wasn't able to blame the judges on the panels of the competitions, where at one time he was winning and then he stops winning and stops getting engagements and so he re-enters that world. And then he finds if he's not winning anymore, yet he can play at the same level. Mm -hmm. And he can't blame his fellow man, and he's not able to blame himself because his consistency is so great. Then that's where the madman can come <laughs> in, and then he can blame his art because yeah, it seduced right. him into it. Mm -hmm. And he was so attracted, as you say, to something really that occupies another time. Mm -hmm. That his tragedy is an idealism that will not blame his fellow man, can't blame himself, so he has almost a quasi Ahab like sense that mm -hmm. art becomes something that you can personify and then perhaps wreak your vengeance upon it. And that was the fun of this book. And you have demonic elements. I mean, the fact that it takes place in a funeral home yes. um, has an interesting metaphor. Mm. Well, absolutely. And I'm mean, here I'm privileged to be around all these pianos in your wonderful studio and your, your showroom. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure many of us have looked at pianos and realized the threat that they can even pose mm -hmm. sometimes. Uh, I'm, uh, many a time I've had my arm raising a lid and warn someone that, you know, you really should not be looking in at that moment. <laughs> right. I remember studying at the pre-college of Juilliard mm -hmm. and I was in a room where they were keeping a harpsichord and my teacher at the pre-college was Leonard Eisner. And we were in a room that was being used as a storage room also for a harpsichord. And I remember he looked over and shivered at it because he said it looked like a coffin. <laughs> And that stuck in my head for years. Mm -hmm. And so the choice of the setting in part right. was the notion that one could have caskets lined up and then you could have <laughs> these young men who were cousins growing up in this home. Sure. And the piano parallel would be there. Well, getting back to the challenges of pianists, because of course there are many people watching who are accomplished pianists mm. or who know accomplished pianists and sure. want to kind of give advice. and. What I found is that the people who are successful, as I mentioned, you have found an outlet in your writing. Yes. And um, I, I want to explore that a little bit in a moment. But I've noticed, for example, Jeffrey Beagle, who I did an interview with, who's a wonderful pianist, mm -hmm. uh, he premieres works of many, many noted composers. Mm -hmm. But he's the one who goes out there for a year raising money for the composers to be mm -hmm. able to take a year off sure. to write these works. And that is a huge undertaking, a business undertaking. Mm -hmm. and I think almost anybody who's successful in classical piano mm -hmm. in the United States in this day and age has to be creative, mm -hmm. has to find outlets that everybody else isn't doing. Because after all, you and I might be able to hear that absolute phenomenal, you know, the essence of piano playing that very, very few people have. But to the average audience, the difference between that yes. and the highly skilled is very subtle. Correct. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of competitions, you have the added element that someone who maybe is the most mature, sophisticated, satisfying artist may not be the person who can just turn it on mm -hmm. and not offend anyone right. and not yes. uh, drop any notes because there's a level of perfection that's kind of a prerequisite. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas some of the greatest pianists of the 20th century, mm -hmm. uh, Alfred Cortot comes to mind, sure. um, even Schnabel, it wasn't always note perfect. Correct. But the music making was mm -hmm. on such a level that it didn't matter. And today, mm -hmm. everybody hears everyone. Mm -hmm. And we're all so used to growing up with note perfect performances mm -hmm. because of the advent of editing mm -hmm. that we all grew up with, that now everybody's playing perfectly or yes. nearly perfectly. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing that I think happens because everybody hears everybody, which back in the 30s and earlier mm -hmm. was impossible, right. there is kind of a homogenization of mm -hmm. interpretations mm -hmm. because everybody Goes, oh no, that's not the tempo. He's supposed to, and everybody's trying to play like everybody else. Right. 
And that's, a, that's a antithetical to what musical expression is all about, don't you think? Absolutely, and of course that can create the paradigm problem in the mind. If everyone feels the standard is something that you can hear and then match, what latitude does one have when they're guiding a young person into it and saying that they are an artist? Mm -hmm. Because that latitude, you know, I always think of the log flume rides that one can encounter in amusement parks where it looks like, it's like a roller coaster and you're sitting in it. And I remember the disappointment I felt as a child when I looked and I saw on the side that there were little wheels that, <laughs> that only briefly don't touch the side. Mm -hmm. And I think we're approaching that mm -hmm. problem in, because the recordings are so prevalent and the homogenization that you're talking about mm -hmm. becomes so much the paradigm that what latitude does one have after a point? And that's where I've, again, felt the, mm -hmm. the notion of the narrative would be, what if you had someone who could serve that negative paradigm of homogenization, succeed for a while, and then because the public is fickle, mm -hmm. advertising might be fickle, and new people come to replace him. Exactly. But again, but he doesn't blame anyone else, and he can keep summoning that, summoning that perfect level. Mm -hmm. Who's he going to blame? Well, the biggest problem is somebody works and works and works, and they have benefactors, yes. so they can do nothing but practice day and night and hone in their skills, but mm. with the, the best coaching and teaching yes. possible. Fly from competition to competition to competition, place in this one, mm -hmm. maybe make semifinals another one, finally land something and get a bit of a career. Mm -hmm. And once we're on the road, mm. they can't practice that much. It's right. impossible. Yeah. So somebody else comes along who's just on that top of the game level, and that's what everybody wants to hear, the latest winner. Yeah. And how does that person maintain a career? It's almost impossible. Without what you had been talking about, which is trying to escape the, the middleman mm -hmm maybe 20th century paradigm? Because I imagine almost all of my heroes really didn't have that to turn to. I don't think mm -hmm. they really had an agent or a manager the way we imagine it. Right. I mean, we read about Mozart writing his concertos for himself and mm -hmm. then marketing it, hiring the orchestra, and we think of him as such an elevated, angelic person, but to imagine him doing that kind of grunt work, and yet you have young people who think that that's nothing that they're going to do. So mm -hmm. you're absolutely right in engendering the notion as we, we speak that I think maybe pianists have to think in those terms. We all have to market. And I want to talk about the marketing of your book, but before we do that, mm. um, I'm wondering, has writing, creative writing, been a parallel for you? And how long and what point did you make the turn where you're focusing more in writing? Mm -hmm. And how did that come to be in your life? Well, thank you uh, for asking. I guess in my early 20s, it happened. I had a teacher that I felt was phenomenal. His name is Gerald Robbins. He was a former mm -hmm. um, Van Cliburn Prize winner. And I was so flattered when he encouraged me at the end of my undergraduate career to consider being his student in terms of continuing and being a competitor. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I still had that little voice in my head that said, I just know that I w either don't have the will or I just ultimately, I know don't have the gift. Mm -hmm. And so in the solitude of at least trying it and giving his flattery a chance. Mm -hmm. I started to write an early novel because I was at home and feeling the, the flush of our mutual Long Island sure. home. And I grew up on the North Shore of Long Island in Northport and I've always been in love with it. And so I wrote this memoir, almost a quasi Proustian memoir of my childhood. And so I had already the experience of writing a long novel. And then I was at a music festival some years later and somehow in the schedule, I wasn't given enough to do. So I had a lot of chance to watch other people play. And I remember sitting there feeling cranky and thinking, you know, why that person and why not me? And that's where this notion came into being. Because it were, I realized I wasn't being fair. That person had as much right, and it was just by chance that maybe they had three sure. chances to perform and I had two. <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't want to be that guy who's going to go through life that cranky. And I kind of know where this is going for me. You and know, so, in a yeah. lot of times in music schools, mm -hmm. the competition becomes so fierce that yeah. people are, are hoping their classmates mess up, yes. you know, and, and have glee rather than to try to just appreciate the joy and the expressive element of the experience. Well, exactly. So then I thought if I had a madman who plays so well that he doesn't feel he's threatened by his competitors, mm -hmm. but because music has failed him, and he decides to re-enter competitions to prove that he's going to prove that music, in a way, is the villain or the white whale that he's going to slay. <laughs> Hence, the people that then become a threat to him are the people that will vote for him. In other words, <laughs> disprove his theory that music 
is flawed because there's a fickleness to whether or not <laughs> when he plays perfectly, some people say, I give you the prize, and then on another day it doesn't work, and yet right. he knows he can always play at the same level. There you so go. So I thought that was a unique concept. Mm -hmm in terms of fueling a madman in music. And I had grown mm -hmm. up with all those wonderful old Hollywood films that used to make classical music the setting. Exactly. The and that scores, doesn't happen anymore. And the scores are wonderful. Oh, mm -hmm. Every emotion was... <laughs> yeah, not only the scores where the music was, the score itself, but mm -hmm. when the source music would be mm -hmm. classical music. I'm thinking of That's Deception with uh, Claude Rains mm -hmm. and Betty Davis with its corn gold score. Well, a lot of times there's light motifs for different characters. Yes. And there's uh, elements where the music is actually explaining plot lines and character yes. development. And I just, as well as I think some people compose for movies to this day, I, I do lament what I think probably someone in 1945, Kansas could plunk down their nickel and what a musical education they could get from right. these masters That's that were churning true. out these scores and oftentimes would romanticize the life of pianists. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they would always give the intimation that they were slightly mad sometimes. <laughs> and I think that's passed away in our culture. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to intimate that it is a mad world, but there's a fun aspect mm -hmm. to that, which I also wanted to conjure. So Absolutely. I certainly don't have a polemical notion to try to dissuade people from mm -hmm. that world or say that it is a demonic notion that sure. we're going to slay music. But well, I want to do You've got to find yeah. your way, something that is yeah. genuine that you can feel passionate about because the sad thing is that so many people work so hard. After all, practicing yes. is lonely business, as is writing, composing. Mm -hmm. And how do you maintain the spark mm. and the enthusiasm and the passion mm -hmm. if you work so hard, mm -hmm. particularly if you're not getting gratif gratifying yes. results? But getting to the marketing of mm. that iron string, mm -hmm. it's interesting. Um, I remember talking with Scott Houston, who's made a name of himself as the piano guy, mm. uh, and the fact that his you know books are you know in Barnes and Nobles mm. and all of that, and it's very impressive. And, mm -hmm. and he had PBS uh, that series that ran for a long time, and interestingly, mm. all that impressive stuff doesn't actually make any money. Mm. People don't make any money anymore on record deals, book mm -hmm. deals, none of it. Yeah. You have to market yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if you're in the bookstore down the street or being played uh, on Spotify, yeah. naturally it helps to market other things. Mm -hmm. And that's how he makes a living, is selling his materials, that little brief uh, blurb at the end of his videos. Yeah. And so, uh, before we go, I want you to kind of just give people pointers because whatever you can mm -hmm. share with what you're doing to help get the message out of your writing mm -hmm. can help anybody to, sure. to uh, market their music, whether mm -hmm. it's recorded or com composing or creative writing. How are you going about getting the message out? Of course, mm -hmm. coming here today, yes. doing other interviews, I, I've seen and read several, several of your interviews mm -hmm. and it's, it's a wonderful thing you're doing, spreading the word and with an important message as well as a fine piece of writing. Well, thank you, Robert. And again, it couldn't happen without sympathetic and very, very gifted and educated people like you that I can come to. And I think it's finding that sympathy and knowing that somehow it's still worth it, even if it's a world that is a struggle, to find people who want to even think that that's worth it to talk about the struggle. On a practical level, I would say, even though I'm talking about how the paradigm of the middleman has to be dodged, I would say, and I'm giving away a little bit of a trade secret, that you have to give the impression that you're somewhat institutional. And I wouldn't say that I so much lie but, or, or fib, mm -hmm. but you can use the imperial we a lot <laughs> sure. and say, you know, we'll be happy to give an interview. We'll be happy mm -hmm. to send you a copy. Absolutely. And it's amazing how the imperial we can come in, in handy mm -hmm. because it gives the impression of the institutional. I probably love no author more than I do Emerson and he always says that a institution is nothing but the length and shadow of one man. Mm -hmm. So if we can cast our shadow, nothing stops you be from becoming your own agent, your own Absolutely. arbiter. Absolutely. You know? So that's, that's how That's a beautiful it. message and I hope this has been helpful for okay. everyone out there. And again, Jack Cole author, That Iron String, and I recommend it highly. It's part of a trilogy. You'll be hearing more about Jack. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you, Robert. It's been an honor. Absolutely. Again, I'm Robert Estrin here at livingpianos.com.